this was the most ideal jump off point before heading all the way up to Alaska to find your wealth or to you know pan for gold right at around that time around the 1910s 20s and 30s we saw a massive influx of Filipinos into this particular city can anyone remember what ha what was happening in the Philippines 1898 1900s War. yes after the there was the Filipino American War which had which saw casualties of the three million Filipinos and that was essentially a war between the United States which bought the Philippines from Spain for how much? 20 million. 20 million, right? You saw an Americanization of the Philippines. Filipinos can easily come to the U.S. And lastly, something happened here that was a really racist policy, which also helped bring Filipinos here. Does anyone know? It has to do with the Chinese. Chinese Exclusion Act? Yeah, exactly. There were Chinese Exclusion Acts here and in Canada. And not only that, there were riots. Uh, from a lot of white laborers who didn't want to see Chinese folks taking over their jobs and coming into the cities, right? And so, which meant that with all the Chinese gone, or at least uh, uh, a lack of an influx of Chinese coming in, there, that meant that there's now more opportunities for other folks to come and to take or to hold menial jobs here on the West Coast, right? And so, all these were a hot spot for Filipinos. They'd come right into those docks and they'd meet their friends from their village and, uh, and they would come back here to these rooms and that's where they would uh, set up shop, live at, until they found out where they were going to next. So there are Filipinos now everywhere and one of those Filipinos was Carlos Belusa. So uh, he was born in 1910 and he traveled here. He was 17 when he left for America. And he moved actually to this. This was the first place he landed, the Eastern Hotel. Okay? So let's go inside and let's, uh, let's go. So this is technically, I think, still called the Carlos Belusan Museum. And so um, I like to start out this particular part of the tour by bringing people's attention to this really amazing mural. You can get a lot out of it, and it really provides a primer or kind of a prologue to, you know, delving deeper into a lot of the historical artifacts that are in this lobby as well as some of the things that we'll see later on. Who wants to go first? Tell me something about this painting that strikes you the most. Um, so on the top right, uh -huh. you have like like a older gentleman with his left fist up and then there's also a sign in the background that says Makubaka. Oh, which yes. could be like, um, you know, a Lulu just fighting for what is, you know, what should be ours. Thank you for starting this off. So let's first begin with the individual with the fist up there, right? That particular part of the painting is, uh, is references a struggle that happened here in the International District <coughs> where they wanted to tear down um, senior housing to build this thing called the Kingdom. And so part of that was a pan-Asian effort. Filipinos, Chinese, uh, even Japanese folks were part of, uh, and this was again during the 70s, so this is a time of great social upheaval and a recognition that you know the government is coming down hard on people of color. And so this was a huge organizing effort to try to prevent that from happening. Unfortunately, it did happen, but it really brought the community together and it helped form Interim Community Development Association. And, you know, that's one particular struggle, but there were always lots of other struggles and lots of other rallies that would happen here in the ID that were that involved Asian folks. There were um, protests against the war. There were also protests against uh, the Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines. The International District was a hub of uh, political activity at that time. I mean, these folks were basically having these, you know, every day, every night, discussions with new Filipinos who were coming into the movement, new workers, talking about their rights and talking about, you know, collective bargaining and talking about how to uh, build power. So men. Chris and Carlos and, and, and then they connected with folks in California to form this really solid, radical Filipino labor network up and down from Alaska, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, right? Um, and so, <clears throat> Carlos Belusan, who was aside from a playwright and a writer, was also a poet, and he wrote a song for, he wrote a poem for Chris Gonzalez. Uh, you can read that here. 
But uh, what the most famous quote is over here uh, from Carlos, <coughs> the excerpt from Song for Christmas Salvas' Birthday. Can I get someone to read that? Oh, Rich, go ahead. Tell us, what does that say? Uh, they are afraid, they are afraid, my brother. They are afraid of our mighty fists, my brother. They are afraid of the magnificent, magnificence of our work, my brother. They are even afraid of our songs of love, my brother. That's right. They're, they're afraid of the solidarity that, you know, Filipinos, they had them in working together against the management and against the corruption within the unions. And it, obviously they were because they were often met with violence and, you know, intimidated by their bosses, right? And so coming into the 60s and 70s, Chris and others started mentoring other folks who were also working in the canneries and who were becoming radicalized by these groups like the Black Panthers and the Brown Berets and the Yellow Menace. That's where we have Silmi Domingo and Jean Viernes. Uh, unlike their compatriots, the folks who came before them, they were born in the United States here in Seattle, right? But like their parents, they worked in the canneries or on fishing boats during the summer and come back and, and then organize in their local communities. And so uh, what we saw was Semi Domingo and Jean Viernes, uh, they did a lot of amazing work to bring Local 37 into the 70s and 60s. Is that the family building? It was actually the old union home for ILWU Local 37. This is where the laborers would wait to get their assignment to go to either Alaska or uh, on a fishing boat out of Seattle. This was the labor hall. As you can see, it's been abandoned for quite some time. It's kind of turned into a quasi art installation. This was a huge hub for Filipino American labor organizing. At this particular corner of the old ILWU um, uh, Local 37 Union Hall, yep. this was the spot where Silmi Domingo and Jean Viernes, uh, who had uh, they were gunned down by two assassins uh, at that corner. And um, those assassins were actually hired by Ferdinand Marcos, the dictator of the Philippines, because he saw what they were doing as a threat to his government. And what they were doing was basically connecting the community and labor organizing in the United States, uh, Filipinos in the United States, with the radical organizing that was happening against Marcos and the dictatorship in the Philippines. And so, you know, what he did was he saw that threat and he hired folks and he, to basically kill them and gun them down. And uh, that's what happened at this corner. And so, as we had mentioned, Carlos Belusan, you know, he was blacklisted. And so it really just drove him into poverty because he was too sick to work. And then no one would buy any of the things that he wrote. And so he spent his later years here in Seattle, Washington, uh, couch surfing. But he would spend a lot of his days here at this park. And then on uh, September 11th, 1956, that's when he passed away, right here at the entrance of the King County Courthouse in this area. This is it. This is the grave site of Carlos Bulusan. Yep, oh. here it is, Carlos Bulusan, 1914-1956, writer, poet, activist. So yeah, so this is the, the final resting place. He, he, when he left the Philippines, in uh, 1930, that's the last he would ever see it again. He never wow. saw it again, and, and he he went all the way up and down from Alaska to Seattle to mm -hmm. Oregon to LA, and uh, and made a huge mark from his writing. You could tell he really missed he really missed being in the Philippines. What yeah, he always thought of the Philippines as his home because yeah. it was really impactful how. You know, the racism he saw, the discrimination, uh, the oppression amongst, uh, uh, within the, um, the factories that, you know, he really began to see that you know, America wasn't his home, but it should have been, you know, yeah. and that's, that's what's really fueled his, his motivation to continue working on behalf of workers and Filipino Americans everywhere. And that legacy is the, is the legacy that a lot of us are a part of today. That long bug sack. Yay! Yay. Oh, that's a little bit more. Right. I heard Yay. four. I heard four. That's good. That's cool. Okay, <laughs> one more down. <laughs> one more. One more down.